talk for a few minutes about being discouraged because of the way. Discouraged because of the way. I'm looking at modern King James. And it says, and they pulled up stakes from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was very discouraged because of the way. Now, there's not a lot of words right there. It's just one verse. But they say so much. And this is speaking of the Israelites. They are, at this point in this story, they are... In the midst of that 40 year wilderness experience. So they've been freed from Egypt's bondage now for quite a while. But it had not been an easy road ever since they rolled out. This was supposed to, this could have been, uh, when you look at it, had they gone straight from point A to point B, I think they could have made the trip in 12 days. It took them 40 years. And the reason for this is because they just couldn't get their stuff right. Have you ever been in a place in your life you just couldn't get your stuff right? You know when you're living in a place where you can't get your stuff right, God's still patient, he still loves you. Problem is you're not getting any closer to where God wanted you to be. But he'll let you wander around there as much of your life as you want to. Are you there? He will not force you to get your stuff right. But the sooner you get your stuff right, the sooner you get to go to his promise. Amen? So here's what's going on with these folks. They've endured a lot. In fact, uh, let me just catch you up really quick. Up, Up to this verse, here's what's been going on previously, recently. So this is what their life has been um, before this verse, like just within the last little bit of time, here's what they've endured. First of all, Miriam has passed away. Miriam was Moses' sister. All of the folks knew Miriam. So they had mourned her death, and then Aaron passed away. So they have just, the whole group has just gone through the death of Miriam and Aaron uh, because both of them had failed. Now, Moses is still around, and he's going to be around a little while. But uh, Miriam and Aaron both are gone. And then they've just gone through the betrayal of Edom that would not let them pass through their land. We'll talk about that a little bit in a minute. Um, Then King Arad had came out against them and killed some of them and took some of them as prisoners. And Israel had been forced to retaliate, which they did. God gave them the victory. But just suffice it to say, after everything that they've been through, you think about if all of that happened to you within a short period of time, what would be a good word to describe how you felt right now? You're just tired. You're just tired. That's a lot of grief. That's a lot of trouble. That's a lot of anguish, stress hardship to endure all I mean those things all at once not like there's a break have you ever felt like you couldn't take one more hit or it's just gonna break you you ever felt that way raise your hand I can't take one more hit or it's just gonna be the straw that broke the camel's back and now this that's what's going on in their life they've dealt with all these deaths they've dealt with the with uh Edom, they've dealt with the enemy, taken, having to go and fight this battle. And now they're going to have to go a, a, around this journey that I'm about to, about, about to explain to you. And it just feels like more than they can take. God, I am tired in my body, in my mind, in my heart, even in my soul. Have you ever been tired even in your soul? If so, you're going to be able to relate to this word today. And if not, you're going to be able to relate to it before too long. Because this is how life works for us. When it hits all at once, sometimes you think, I'm just going to lose my mind. Now, I want to talk to you for a minute about what made their suffering so heavy. I'm going to give you three reasons. You can write these down if you want. But there's probably more than this. But there's at least three reasons why they are discouraged because of the way. Now, understand the way. The way represents the direction, the situation, or the place that they are in their mind and their body and their soul. So it's not just about a location. It's about all of those things. So you say to yourself, a lot of you could relate probably to this word already by saying, 
things are going, uh, you know, I still have the same job. I still drive the same way to work. It's not like I'm going in a different direction. But I'm discouraged because of the way things are happening right now. Am I talking to anybody? I'm discouraged because of the way. So I'm going to describe for you why this way was so terrible. Number one, it's because it was a terribly difficult way to go. So if you understand the terrain that they're in, if you study this, you see where it was that they start from and where they're going. It is, uh, these are hostile mountains. It's a good way to say it. They're just hostile. Um, How many of you all like walking in deep sand and gravel for a long period of time? You say, well, it's kind of fun when we're on vacation and we're down at the beach. Yeah. But you're not doing it for a long period of time. You know how it is when you're, you, you're constantly stopping and having to empty out your crocs because they keep getting full of gravel? Anybody been there? <clears throat> Every step you take, you take a couple steps, then you have to stop and empty out your shoe again. You're just sinking in the sand. And gravel's all filling up your shoe. It's a miserable way to walk. Now, they're, this is, these are, they're walking through mountains, and this is their footing. The shade that they have basically is these just these low level shrubs. They're not very tall. And so they're not having the opportunity to get in the shade. If they want to get in the shade, they got to get down on the ground, crawl under shade, I'm assuming. It's desolate. This is also a place that sandstorms come up, just come up. So here you are between these mountains. You're walking along in sand and gravel, and here comes the sandstorm, and there's nothing to get behind, and there's nowhere to go. Now, how long, let's say you're one of the three million that are on this journey out in this wilderness, on this desert. You don't know what's going on because you don't have access to the leadership to find out what they're hearing, and you're just getting it passed down from everybody else. So you're out in the middle of everybody else. You're trying to carry all your stuff. You're dragging all your stuff. Carrying your house with you, you're carrying all this load, you got, you're trying to keep the kids together, and this goes on day after day after day, it's tedious, you are trudging through this mess, it's stressful, and there seems to be no end. Now some of you say, well that's not the physical place that I'm at, but spiritually, mentally, physically, I have felt like that's where I am, and I'm just discouraged because of the way. Amen? I feel like all I do is just go a couple steps and empty gravel out of my crocs. And I'm just getting tired. I'm just getting tired. And you start losing hope. You walk like that for a while, and you start losing hope. Secondly, I want you to understand what made this way so terrible for them. It was caused by their own family. Let me explain that. So Jacob and Esau, brothers, their descendants are who? Esau's descendants are Edom, the Edomites. Jacob's descendants are the Israelites. The Israelites are trying to get to the promised land, and they need to go through the Edomites' land. And the Edomites say, no, you can't come through here even though you're promising not to tear nothing up. Even though you're promising not to mess anything up, no. In fact, it's not just that, but the Edomites come out to to face them with all of their weapons and take a stand against their own cousins and say, these are their cousins, and say, if you come in here, we're going to kill you. With family like that, you don't need enemies. Am I right? Don't holler amen or point at anybody, but some of us have got family members that have caused us to be discouraged because of the way. Because we cannot stay ahead of their dumb decisions. We try to help them. We try to bail them out. They're driving us insane because the very minute we help get one mess fixed, they make six more. Am I right? Pastor, I'm just wore out. My kids are driving me nuts. My parents are driving me nuts. My my children that are prodigals are driving me insane. They make the stupidest decisions. We can't afford to keep bailing them out. 
we're in a terrible place, Pastor, in our mind, physically, spiritually. But we're just tired to our soul, and it's because of our own stinking family. Still there? So the terrain is terrible. And the reason we're in this mess is because our own family keeps doing this to us. And then thirdly, this is the one that takes the cake. Are you ready? This is the one that's illogical. You don't even blow your, it blows your mind. Here's the reason why they're discouraged because of the way. It was in the wrong direction. And they all knew it. They knew they were going here. They were supposed to be going here. But Moses says, we're going to go here by going this way. And they're walking in this type of difficult terrain because their own family wouldn't let them go that way, which would have been quicker. So they're walking in this terrible terrain. They're walking in this miserable desert, and they're not even going in the right direction. How could this be God's will? We're not getting any closer. You still with me? We're not getting any closer we're getting, for every step we take in this miserable direction is further away from where God told us to go. How could God be in this? Have you ever asked that? How can this be you, God? We're not even going in the right direction. Are you lost, God? You know, you've heard us tell the story, but I won't tell all of it, but years ago, Nolan and I and and Tom Davis and Danny Key, with the, it was our first missions trip from this church. And Nolan led us. And we went to Peru. And Peru was fun, wasn't it, Nolan? We lost 10 pounds in nine days. And I'm not joking about that. And uh, poor Danny Key's brother passed away. And Danny had to leave. And we hated that he had passed away. But we were so thankful that Danny left his suitcase because he brought snacks. And we ate those snacks. And it was miserable and it was hot and there was no ice in that town. It's, I'm talking about, are you, come on, are you kidding? I'm not kidding. We said, I, I finally got with the missionary and I said, look, buddy, you got a chance to make a lot of money here this week. Ten, we, we, this is like a 14-day trip. I said, you got, you got a bunch of gringos here. We're dying, man. It's 100 degrees out here, and, we ha and the water that we have is room to, it's sitting out in the sun. I mean, we're in a desert. We're drinking 95-degree water while we're trying to lay blocks. We're dying. He said, well, there ain't no ice. I said, how far is nearest ice? He said, two-hour drive. And I said, go get it. Here's the money. Go get it. And Nolan gave them the money, and they drove two hours away, and they came back, and it was like a scene from 150 years ago. He drives up in the car, he opens up the trunk, pulls out this huge block of ice that's wrapped. It's in a, bar, in, in a, uh, a burlap bag full of barley. And that was to try to keep it from, because it came two hours, and they don't have a, a, an igloo to keep it in to keep it from melting. So this is their way of trying to keep it melting. And so we take... We took that and we put it in the biggest cooler that we had. And we put, we couldn't drink their water, obviously. But we, we filled it with their water and put the ice. And then we took our water bottles and just dropped them down in that water to cool it off. And every day when it came time to take a, a, a shower, there was none. And so they took us down to the dam. And the natives crawled up in the truck and went down with us to watch the white guys take baths. And we would crawl out of the truck and we would crawl into a stream with a bar of soap and we would sit there in the middle of a stream and we would wash off with this and, and then we'd climb back up in the truck and we'd go back to stay at, uh, at the place where we were staying where, that we, where that, uh, there, was no, uh, there wasn't any electricity and uh, the donkeys were sticking their head through the windows and braying at us at the night. And the pigs were running all the way around it. And the, and, and, the, and the natives were standing there looking through the windows, standing there holding the bars, looking through and watching us change clothes and watching us get ready to go to bed. And, I mean, we're, wa we're watching for scorpions and we're killing scorpions. And, and, and it was a fun trip. That was a fun one. 
At the end of it, we go on an R&R, and, &R and, and they, uh, it, it was amazing. I mean, we got to go to this, to this uh, Wycliffe Bible Translators uh, location and spent the night, and we actually got to take showers and eat real food, and, and I mean, it was just crazy. And so we get up the next day, and we're going to the airport. And some of the guys were going to go on with a trip, but, but me and Tom and a guy named Lowell Moore were, we'd had enough and we were coming home. Nolan was, Nolan was, a, a, he was, he was our soldier, he was our commander, and he had to stay with the troops. But I didn't have to. <laughs> you got this, Nolan, I'm going home, I can't take it anymore. And so me and Tom and Lowell, we got in a cab, and uh, the, the missionary told him, take these guys in Spanish, take them to the airport, don't just take them to the gate, he said, take them all the way in, don't leave them outside, here's the money, da-da-da, told me, don't let him, you know, don't let him do this or this or whatever. And so I noticed that as we left the compound, Nolan, we were driving, and I would start looking up and seeing airplanes. And the airplanes were coming in, but they were going over there, and we were driving over there. Yeah, Robert, I mean, it kind of got spooky. I started looking around, and this guy, you know, every once in a while, he, he, you know, they all drive with their hand on the horn, one hand on the wheel, one of them, like this. But every once in a while, he'd turn loose of the horn long enough to try to grab something out of the glove box. But we had our suitcases. This was like, this was like me and Tom and Lowell and the driver and all of our luggage for two weeks in a little small, mid-sized little Nissan compact car. So the trunk is full. The three of us are in the back. If you can imagine, I'm sitting in the middle, and, I, and my head's bent like this. Because my head, I'm too tall to, to be in. So I had one arm around each guy, and I'm riding like this. And all of our luggage is in the front seat. So every time he tries to get in the glove box, he can't get in because our luggage is in the way. But he's driving extremely slow, which is not characteristic. Nobody else was. So he's driving slow. He's going in the wrong direction. And every time we stop, he tries to move our luggage to get something out of the glove box. And I'm thinking, uh-oh, we got set up. And I'm trying to think this through because this was, this was 27 years ago. So I was, I was still just, you know, I was about Bradley's age at that time. And I'm thinking, the other guys were quite a bit older than I was. So I'm thinking, this guy is fixing to rob us and I got to take him out. <laughs> we're in another country here. And... He is taking us someplace. He's got some, I, all this is going through my brain. I'm not saying anything, but he's got some buddies. They're getting ready to take us to the side alley. He's got a gun. If I let him get us there, they're going to pull, they're going to kill us and take our stuff. And I'm thinking this thing through. And I mean, I had it down. He, he kept this up for a few minutes longer. And I, and I thought when he, next time he reaches for when he pulls that out, when he, before he can get that out of that glove box, I'm going to come across his seat and take his head off. He said, were you the pastor at the time? Yeah, I was the pastor. That was a lot younger back then. I just still tried to do that today, though. <clears throat> so he's, so this is on, you know, horns honking. Airplanes are getting way away from us now. We're still driving. We're going in the opposite direction where we're supposed to go. He finally stops the car. He reaches up, moves that luggage at a stoplight, opens that thing up. I come over the back seat. I'm, I'm porched up over the back seat ready. He reaches in, pulls something out, and just before I smoke him, Connor, he opens up a case and takes out his glasses. <laughs> Puts them on, looks around. Something like, oh, and turns the car and starts going toward the airport. <laughs> Sometimes you could get discouraged because of the way. You get very unsure about things. You can start asking a lot of crazy questions, especially when you're going in the wrong direction. Now, all these look like seemingly good reasons to be discouraged, right? So where did these people mess up? 
Because I, I'm convinced that when I'm reading this story, you still there? I, I'm convinced that it's okay for them to be tired. It's okay for them to be upset. It's okay for them to be angry. It's okay for them to be questioning. Where did they mess up? Because here's the thing you need to understand. I use this word, and the kids aren't in here because I get in trouble for saying these kind of words sometimes. Because you're not supposed to say these kind of words in public because they're rude words. But God is okay with you being stupid. He is. He lets you be stupid the majority of your life. He still loves you through it. He don't leave you that way, but he's okay. If, as long as you want to be stupid, he'll let you. And a lot of people are being stupid, and they're just spinning around making dumb decisions. And they'll do it. Some people do it for five years. Some people do it 40 years. That's why some people, when they're 60 years old, they're still making stupid decisions because they never got their stuff straight. God's okay with that. Like, if you want to waste your life, you want to miss your call, it's cool. I got, you know, I'm still here with you. I'm still for you. So... God's okay with that. What he's not okay with is what I'm about to tell you. So I want you to look at chapter 21, verse 5. And the people spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there's no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul hates this light bread. Well, I'm with them there. I hate light bread. You know, like that, like that 45 calorie bread. Deb buys that every once in a while. You can't even smear no peanut butter on that mess. Am I right? I like that big old thick sourdough bread to make you fat. But that's not what they're saying here. That's not what that means. That's the way it's translated, but I'm about to tell you what the word there actually meant. So here's what they did. Here's where they made the mistake. They spoke against God. They spoke against God's leader, and they spoke against God's provision. Now, they knew full well that God had been providing them food and water. Somebody tell me real quick, what have they been eating out here all these years? Where'd they get it? Down at Harps? Huh? God had been providing them manna from heaven every day, and the food was so good. Now, it might have been the same. That bread might have been the same every day, Marty. But here's what we know about it. The word said that his provision for them was so good that in 40 years, none of them even got sick. Their clothes weren't wearing out. This is a good God that was taking care of them, and they're stupid. See, God takes care of you even, even in your stupid. Their clothes aren't wearing out. They're being provided for every day. So they're eating manna from heaven. Now, somebody tell me any other time in the history of mankind that God provided manna for another group of people for 40 years. They just got done eating it that morning when they're saying this. They're going to have it for lunch. Are you still there? They said... Why'd you bring us out here to die in this wilderness? You ain't dying. For there is no bread. That's a lie. You just got done eating it. And there's no water. Yes, there is. Look back to chapter 20. They just got done drinking water out of a rock that God provided for them. <laughs> are, you, are you seeing this? And our soul hates this light bread. So first they say we got no bread. Then they say we got somebody's light. Same sentence. We don't have no bread, but we got this light bread and we hate it. You seeing it? Here's what they said, though, when they used that, that word. You see the word light? That word translates to this. You ready? It translates to these words, vile, contemptible, unsubstantial, and malnourishing. That's what they said about God's provision. And that tore it with God. That tore it. He said, I'll deal with your stupid. I can handle you being angry and upset, complain all it. But when you start saying that what I've been doing for you is vile and contemptible and unsubstantial and malnourishing, that's where we got a problem. So you think as a father, 
you have children that you're trying to help, and they come to you, and you help them time and time again, and then they turn on you, and they say, well, that money you gave us for the car payment wasn't enough. Well, it was enough to make the car payment. Yeah, but it wasn't enough because we wanted to buy beer, and we didn't have enough for the, we need more for the car. And dad says, that tears it. That's it. Done. I'm done. I'm done. So he'd been providing for them, and now they attack him in this way. Even in this state of mind, they got so much going wrong, so desperately discouraged, they didn't understand who it is they should have been attacking. Have you ever done that? Things in your life go wrong, immediately you just start blaming God. God's like, what are you talking about? I'm the one that's with you. I'm the one that's getting you through this. I'm the one that provides for you every single day, helps you pay all your bills, make sure you got food in the cat. What are you talking about? The devil over there would kill you in a heartbeat. He wants you to, he wants you to be destitute. He wants you to be broke. He, 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 he would kill you in a heartbeat. The reason you're alive is because of me. Why are you attacking me? Why don't you attack him? He's the guy that hates you. Well, we do it, don't we? I'm preaching today. Every bad thing happens in our life. Why'd God let this happen? If God's such a loving God, he's so good, why'd he let this happen? God's like, stuff's going to happen, but I said I'd be with you always. You're only here through this because of me. Don't make it worse by attacking the only one that's for you, covering you, that's with you. He's not the problem. He's the solution. Attack the devil, not God. Now, let me show you what I mean. Here's what God was doing for them. So you're hearing this. They're on this way. It's a discouraging way. They're discouraged to their very soul because of this way. They're angry and they're taking it out on God. And what they don't realize is that even in this terrible way, this is God leading them. Let me show you how, what I mean. Here's what it did. By them being on this discouraging way... Number one, it saved them from having to go through another war. Because they were in no shape at that point for another battle. And God knew it. God said, I'm not going to have you cousins killing each other over this. I'll take care of you and I'll bring you on another direction. It's going to be all right, but you don't need to have to go through another battle, another loss. We don't need to have to have more funerals. We don't need to, right, to have, have all these guys that are wounded. We don't need to go through all this. So I'm going to take you in a different direction. It ain't going, you're not going to like the direction, but I'm actually saving your tail. All right, you still there? Number two, it prepared them to overcome later. Because even though this is not actually an all-inclusive result, resort, it's better than anywhere else they would have been at that time. Given the situation where they are, it may be a terrible place, but it is absolutely the best place for them right now. And God knows that. They don't, but he does. You're applying that to your own life? I don't like the place I'm at right now, Pastor, but God knows this is the best place for you right now. Mm. In spite of the hardship, in spite of the losses, God is getting you ready. God's making you tough. God's making you strong. God's giving you something to recall when harder days come. You're going to look back on this and say, you're going to look back on this and say, man, if I could go through that, I could go through anything. And that's what happens when God takes you through these hard, discouraging times. You look back on them and you say, good night, if I could do that. You always have that in your pocket from then on. If I could do that, now I can go wherever God leads me. And number three, it made them grateful for the victories that were coming. Because they're going to look back on this and be grateful for better days. There's going to be days of success. They're going to be victorious days. Really good days are in their future. And they're going to be much more appreciative of that when they get to it. But they got to go through this first. And here's what they've done. They did the last thing they should have done. The, the very thing I'm trying to keep any of you from doing. They did the, the worst, the very worst thing they could have done. So, when they attacked God, God attacked back. 
That's the last thing they wanted. So the point here is I want you to be able to walk through that discouraging season in your life and make the right decisions and turn to God instead of away from him so that you don't do what they did. Here's what they did. They attacked God, and guess what he did? He sent serpents into their midst, and it bit them and killed them. Now they're dying out in this terrible place on top of everything else. So they had turned against their only source of help, and then God turns on them. Look at verse 6. And Jehovah sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people died. And the people came to Moses and said, we've sinned. At least they realize it. For we've spoken against Jehovah, and we spoke against you. Pray to him that he'll take away the serpents. And Moses prayed for the people, and Jehovah said to Moses, Now make a fiery servant, a serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that when everyone is bitten and he looks upon it, he'll live. Now that's another message, but suffice it to say, here's what they did. They acknowledged their sin. They repented for what they'd done. And God sends healing to them through this emblem of a serpent on a pole. Why? The serpent was a reminder of the sin. And the pole was a reminder of what to do when they sinned. What do you mean by that? Later on, Jesus, what, would be crucified on a pole. And anybody that would look upon Jesus would be what? Saved. Here's an emblem of what was coming, a foreshadowing of what was happening, what was coming. Now, we look, we're on this side of it today, so we look to the cross. We look back to the cross. They were looking forward to the cross. So they, they acknowledge what they've done. They repent, and God sends them a process for healing. I won't go into that anymore, but I want to just say this. It's okay to be discouraged because of the way. It's, that part's okay. It's okay. There's, because there's no way that you could know everything that God knows, and there's no way that, that you can know how he's bringing you through this or what he's sparing you from. You can't know those things. When you're out there, you can't know those things. So it's okay for you to be upset and angry and all that, but here's what you need to do. Make sure that you're hating the devil, that you're blaming the devil, that you're rebuking the devil, that you're angry and upset at the devil because it's not okay to take it out on God. And that's the lesson. He's your help, not your hindrance. We're all going to get discouraged because of the way. If you're not today, you, you will. I mean, your time is coming. We're all, it's it's going to happen to all of us at some point, several points throughout your life. You're going to get to those places where you're like, I am so tired, I cannot take one more hit. I cannot take one more one more straw would break the camel's back. I, I cannot do this. The, the, everything's got to turn around, right? And you think that. But God really knows what you can take, and he knows what he's doing. He knows where he's leading you, all those. I don't need to say all that again. But when you get discouraged because of the way, turn to God instead of away from God. Because if you don't, guess what's going to happen? You're going to be in need of healing. You're going to be in need of healing. If you attack God at your down point instead of praising him through it, if you attack God at the down point and you start saying that everything God's done for me up to this point in my life, nothing. God says, well, but all, what about all the times I, I brought you through this and I healed your body and I healed your kids and I saved your family and I did this? And you're like, it don't matter because you won't do this for me now. And God's like, you better watch it. You better watch it. You're getting real. You're on the thin ice. You're on the thin ice. I don't care, God. All those blessings you provided for me in the past were vile, contemptible, unsubstantial, malnourishing. And God's like, okay. Here's you a snake. See what you think about that. Get you some of that and then see what you want to do. I'm going to send you the snake so you'll realize next time he's the one doing this, not me. Let me put the snake in here so that he bite when he bites you because he will every single time. Let me let the snake bite on you a little bit and then you'll realize it's not me biting, it's him. But let's not have to get there, church. Some of us could raise our hands and say, when we were discouraged because of the way, we made a wrong choice, and guess what it cost us? We got bit. 
Anybody ever got bit? You don't want to do it again. Amen? Those of us that bit, we don't want to do that again. So how are we going to keep that from happening? Simply by this. Anybody say, I'm discouraged, lift your hand and say, I'm discouraged. I'm discouraged to my soul. I'm just discouraged because of the way. It's okay. Just don't start trying to blame God. Blame the devil. Hate the devil. Huh? Hate the devil. What do I do? Hate the devil so bad in the midst of your misery that you make his life miserable. What do you do when everything's coming against you? What do you do when the devil's attacking you and God's trying to lead you away from this whole mess, but it looks like a terrible place he's leading? What do you do? Just keep serving Jesus, loving Jesus, working for Jesus. And the devil, oh man, he hates that. He just hates that. And you just keep stacking up victories. You're going to come through this. You've come through everything else. You're coming through this. You're going to be all right. God's going to give you guidance. He's going to give you strength. He's going to give you help. He's going to give you wisdom. He's going to, all these things in, in abundance more than you ever had before. In fact, you're going to be so much better when this is over. You know how much better you're going to be when this is over? You're going to go from being the whiner and the crier to being the person that can tell somebody else what to do when they're in this situation. They say, man, my life is miserable. I'll be like, yeah, I've been there. Man, this, 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 and this. Yeah, I've been there. What'd you do, curse God and die? Nope. I praised God, and he brought me through it. So we're going to wrap this up this morning. Victor's going to say a few words at the end. But here's how we're going to do it. We're going to finish with this song. And those, all of those of you in this room who say, Pastor, I have just been so discouraged because of the way. I'm discouraged all the way down. I'm just tired to my soul. I want you to sit right where you're at, or you can kneel in these. I don't care. Come to the altar. Whatever you want to do. Kneel. Where I don't give a rip. Do whatever you want to do. But wherever you decide, I want you to get with this word over this next few minutes. Sit there and let the Holy Spirit bring back to you the parts that you need. And just sit there and spend time with the Lord and let the Lord work. Because you may have come into this thing very discouraged. But you're going to leave encouraged. Now, when I leave, am I going to find myself outside the door? Out, out of there? Is that done? I don't know. That's between you and God. I don't know when that's over. But I do know that he's going to keep providing you the manna. He's going to keep providing water out of a rock if he has to. He's going to take, your shoes aren't going to wear out, your clothes aren't going to get old. And I mean, he's going to take care of you. He's going to keep you through this because he's a good, good father. Amen. Y'all come find yourself a place to pray. I love you. I appreciate you. Have a great week.